Today's Father's Day, and I want you all to meet a dad who set an example that I would like to try to learn from. I'm a dad who's struggling to know what it means to be a good father and a good grandfather at this point in my life. And I'm trying to leave a legacy for my descendants, and I'm trying to lay the kinds of foundations that that legacy can rest on for a really long time, like three and four and five generations or more. And that is what will be the, the real measure of my life and the end of my life. Will my family even remember that I was here on earth and what I was trying to accomplish? And so let's talk about John Winthrop because he really did set the kind of example that I want to follow, that you should follow, my son should follow. And very few people remember today that he was here and that he was a remarkable dad and that he was a remarkable founding father of the United States. And this is one reason I want to remember him today and look at what he did and at the example that he set and what happened to his children and how that legacy has been helping our country even though we know so little bit about John Winthrop and have been so careless in honoring his memory. So let's see if we can change that right now. John Winthrop was born in 1587 to a wealthy family in England, and he could have had a really comfortable life, but he was a Protestant Christian, and the ruling royal family of the United Kingdom at that time was launching programs to persecute Protestants who simply didn't go along with the political correctness of the day. Does that sound familiar? So John Winthrop, as a, a lawyer and an investor, was trying to get a business off the ground with other investors and a fleet of ships. I think he was putting together a fleet of 16 ships which could carry Christian settlers away from the tyranny of Charles I to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And they, of course, they would make, they would make round trips, take settlers over and bring goods back for trading in England, goods that were, were needed. By the time uh, John had started this business, or work to start it, he had married and he had started a family, and he writes about some of the problems that he was having as a father because he, he wanted to be a good dad. He wanted to lay foundations for the future. And one of his sons was really responsible, but the other son, Henry, was into wine and women and song and overspending and debt and irresponsibility. And does that sound familiar? So Mr. Winthrop did everything he, he could to try to help Henry, but Henry was a stubborn learner. In 1630, the dad took the son, Henry, on a remarkable voyage to the New World. And he was, he was keeping Henry with him all the time, helping him, learning to love him, learning, learning to get close to him. Now the other son, John, and John's wife, Margaret, would come later on a different ship. But by now, in 1630, John Winthrop had agreed to be the first official governor of the colony, and he had hope realistic hope of seeing a huge Christian settlement developed both commercially and culturally in the New World. The colony would theoretically trade with local Indians, and this was in the business plan, and with Mexico, and with England, and the West Indies. And so settlers would come over going to the West, and then all these goods would go back going to the East. The profits could go into further trading and further settlement and shipping and housing and agriculture and fishing and farming tools and roads. But most importantly, the colony was to become a secure base for, for Puritan and other Christian refugees from the exploding religious turmoil in England. He was getting pretty bad, especially with Charles I coming to the throne. And so this was to be, in the New World, an advanced island of freedom in the wilderness of North America. There were risks, of course, it was a pretty dangerous place and there was nothing there in this area where they were going in Massachusetts. Now, the pilgrims, the famous pilgrims of Plymouth had come there uh, about uh, in, in 1620. And, and, if, and if you remember, it was so dangerous, uh, half of them died in the very first winter. But they stayed on, they kept going, and they had seen they had seen some progress by this time, by 1630, 10 years later. So on the voy voyage over, John Winthrop was really hopeful that they could really see something happen happening. And so he was spending time with the settlers on the ship, speaking to them, talking to them, making plans. Um, and he spent time 
going into great detail about the overall vision, building the colony into a thriving civilization. I mean, it was going to be pretty simple at the beginning. But then he talked about the next year and the next decade and the next several decades and the next generations. He talked about all of these things. And we, these are the kinds of things we can be doing with our children. They need to be seeing that, that life doesn't end with one or two generations. They need some context to see who came before them. Well, John Winthrop did. These Americans came before us. They came before your children. How long before? Well, look, do the math. 1630 is a long, long, long time ago, and they've been building ever since. So what Winthrop did, as he talked about this, he drew a phrase from the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible, <clears throat> explaining the mission to construct a city on the hill. A city on a hill, that's a, a phrase that Jesus Christ was using in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you're, you're gonna be the light of the world, you Christian. You're gonna be a city on a hill. A city on a hill that's built on a hill cannot be hidden. And John Winthrop was saying, this is what we're doing. This is our mission. This is what we'll be, we'll be accomplishing. And he wanted to be a good example. He wanted this city to be a good example of an organized, orderly, lawful city. And he also said this. He said that if they failed in building a good, a good biblical foundation for what they were doing that would last generation after generation, the city could, it could get big but it could become known later as a worthless example, good, good only to be criticized and mocked worldwide, you know, good only to be uh, trampled under the feet of men because it was like salt at the beginning but then lost its savor. And that's also from the Sermon on the Mount. Winthrop said their city could, if they weren't careful, become a byword among the nations, meaning people would laugh at it and mock at it because of what it became. Because once you build a city on a hill, the whole world does see it. It can't be hidden, whether it's really good or whether it's really wicked. And so <clears throat> Winthrop expected, as he was traveling over there, to see a thriving two-year-old settlement because they had sent a boat over there earlier, two years ago, in 1628. He had expected to see this thriving settlement of houses and, and fields cleared and forests cleared and rocks moved into, into little rock walls around, around. But when he arrived and the ship drew near to the coast on, on June 2nd, all he could see were remnants of a miserable shanty town. And these thin, these thin figures move, moving around very slowly, these malnourished settlers, those few who had survived a killing winter, they just shuffled around like, like slow-moving zombies. Author Peter Marshall described them and said, the life was gone out of their faces. The life was gone out of their faces and their expressions. So this was a real crisis. And there was good reason to question whether the weak, these weak that, that, that he was, John was seeing when he arrived and made it onto the land and looked at them, there was a question as to whether they could make it out alive, whether they could make it through another winter. There was a good reason to wonder if the colony would even survive another year without failing and the business endeavor to, would just fail. So Winthrop went to work immediately to prepare the, the weakened survivors for another coming winter. It's, it's June 2nd. They don't have all that much time. It's summer, but winter is coming. And he realized if, if, we, if we see the dates of the first frost and we plan backward, there's a lot of work to do. And he was the governor. He, he was responsible for these souls. And he was not a day too early in organizing all the work that needed to be done. He did look after every soul individually. He, he didn't see them as, as some elite governors do, and elite bureaucrats do, and elite technocrats do. At just seeing people as a, this mass that you manage and you engineer them. He was looking at every individual heart and soul and trying to help them. And so he managed the labor schedules, the medical treatments, the food rations, the collecting of building materials for the log cabins, the planting of corn, the receiving of other shiploads of new settlers when they would come. And that's what he was, that's what he was focused on in the very first days that he was there. And he, and he learned very quickly the settlement they were building was not in the most perfect place, and he had to move them in the course of doing all this work with them. He had to move them and shift them just a little bit to a better location. And that location became the village of Boston. 
and then later the city of Boston, and then the world leader of, of, of Boston, Massachusetts. The next 10 years would see 20,000 people arriving, including his son John and his wife Margaret. But when they got there, when they finally got there, he had to tell them that Henry had died in an accident involving one of their small fishing boats. But John Winthrop and his family continued to build with hope and with optimism because they could see really far in, into the future. Yes, they were grieved. Yes, John had put a lot of time into Henry. He loved Henry. He loved his son. He was grieved for a very long time after his death, but he kept building. And others were dying too, but he kept building. And others were being born there in the little settlement. Others were being married there, and they were building a future. Now, here's something that I learned about Winthrop. I, I want to, I want to, I want you to know, from that very first day that he stepped ashore, this governor, His Excellency Gover Governor Winthrop, he stunned the settlers by his smart, optimistic, and vigorous leadership. He, he really got right to work, and he really was smart. And he was a good organizer. He was a good administrator. And even in the face of crisis, he was optimistic and full of hope and could communicate to these people who were sick and they were near death and they... They had lost hope, and he could give hope to them. Now, he civilized that place as though his life depended on it, and their lives depended on it, and it really did. That's how hard he was working. Now, Winthrop also surprised the colony even more by the way that he dressed. And this, this is interesting. He's this very wealthy man who's the governor of the colony. Never did he force himself on the colony as the proper English gentleman ruler. He lived with the settlers in poverty. From day two, now I think from what I understand, the first day he landed, he, really, he was dressed like a governor and he had his people and his assistants with him then. But on day two, he dressed like a field hand. And all the succeeding days, he dressed like a field hand and he worked with his hands in poverty with all these people from dawn to dusk. Every able-bodied man, woman, and child followed his, his leadership and, and remembered where he had come from. He had, he had left Groton Manor, which was one of the grandest uh, manors there in England at the time. And he left it to build this city on a hill that was starting off in poverty, starting off in a little, a little shanty town. And he was very willing. Now listen to this, this, this story. In one of the letters that he wrote home to his wife after he had been there for three months, He said this to her. He said, I never fared better, meaning with better health, in my whole life. I've never had better health in my whole life. I have never slept better, he said. I have never had more contentedness of mind, he said. And I think the reason is he knew he was building something of meaningful, lasting value. And I don't know how far into the future he could see, but here, here we are. Here we are now, these many hundreds of years later, reflecting on it, seeing what Boston became, seeing what the United States became, and much of that is due to his hard work and sacrifice. He was building a city on a hill. The world, yeah, the world was watching. And the world watched, you know, as the decades rolled on. They watched the Bostonians take on the British military and defend their, independent, their independence in 1775. And then the world read those documents that Americans were writing at that time the later Founding Fathers. They read our new Constitution in 1789. In 1835, the world uh, read Alexis de Tocqueville's book called Democracy in America. Uh, and, and in that, he said, Boston is the most advanced, refined, civilized, and educated of all of America's cities. This is what Boston was becoming. Now, let me show you this gravestone in one of the early cemeteries in Boston, erected by descendants who did remember John Winthrop and his legacy. And this is the, the family burial plot, and the sons of John Winthrop are listed here, and the grandsons, and then the great-grandsons, and, and on. John Winthrop, it says, first governor of Massachusetts, and his son John, who was the responsible son, he became the first governor of Connecticut. And then his grandson, Major General Fitz John Winthrop, who became also the gov governor of Connecticut, and then Major General Waitstill, Winthrop, the Chief Justice of Massachusetts. There's Adam Winthrop, a great-grandson who died in the year 1700. Colonel Adam Winthrop, who died in the year 1743. 
Professor John Winthrop, who died in 1779. And then Anne, a great-great-granddaughter, who is the wife of David Sears, it says, then Thomas Lindell Winthrop, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, and then Francis William Winthrop, who died in 1819. And lastly, Thomas Lindell Winthrop, who died in 1920. The year Boston really began going downhill into lawlessness. But for 270 years, the descendants of John Winthrop helped build a city on a hill, which was moving in the right direction. 270 years was moving in the right direction. And the entire world watched the progress of that city. And now the entire world is watching the degradation of Boston, just like John Winthrop said they would if, if they became lawless and veered off track. John Winthrop's life was not easy as the first governor. I, I've read stories about how hard it was for him. The new settlers who kept coming, who were strangers, he didn't know them, all of whom were strong risk-taking colonists who had their own ideas of how things could work and should work. And Governor Winthrop once was accused of being arbitrary, which was which much like what was happening with Charles I, who was a wicked arbitrary leader. That was a really bad word, being an arbitrary leader, not going, not going by the rules, not going by law, just making things up and changing, uh, changing the deal. Rather like Moses uh, was accused by his own brother and his own sister one time. Governor Winthrop had, had to go through that same kind of challenging of his authority. And he defended himself and he clarified the laws of Massachusetts into one of the most respected biblical legal codes of history. And I'm going to link to that below. And I'm also going to link to some of his other, his other writings, including that message that he gave to the travelers who came with him on the ship in 1630 when he talked about his vision to build a city on a hill. And <clears throat> these are the kinds of foundations that his sons and his grandsons and his great-grandsons built on as they laid the legal and the social foundations of the United States. It wasn't just Boston. People were reading all these documents and learning from them and copying the things that, that were really good. I really appreciate his legacy. And I've talked to, about it with my family and with my sons. Perhaps my five sons can stand on my shoulders and go much farther than I do just like the descendants of John Winthrop did. And I, I think they might. I'm really proud of my five sons and their 11 children. So happy Father's Day to them, uh, to their wives, and to all of you.